This 13-slide presentation covers the various spatial dimensions above time, which have been mapped and labeled while journeying through the world of philosophy. These dimensions are necessary to describe the most important aspects of philosophy, the journey philosophy takes from teacher to student and through authors and the audience. The purpose of existence, as far as modern philosophy is concerned, is a circle or ascending spiral of philosophical liberation from author and publisher to audience and back again. These days it is getting easier and easier for the audience to participate, becoming authors and publishers of their own content. All that we know comes to us through what we experience, whether those experiences are real or imagined, or whether those experiences are created and published by others, as in books, music, videos, or other creative works. We are all students and teachers now. Also known as the box, the first three dimensions are the familiar three spatial dimensions that comprise our reality. The ability to recreate these dimensions in the mind gives us the form of space, or the mind, in which to place concepts such as Plato's forms and other concepts. Awareness of form is the foundation of philosophical knowledge, and the ability to create mental space, or a mind that is not closed, is the beginning of mastery over it, and eventual freedom from confinement in it. A person whose mind is already crowded with problems and preconceived notions may have difficulty creating space for new ideas. Going for a walk, talking to a friend, or even making a video rant is a good way to empty the mind and get back some much-needed space. If this video seems too much to handle now, just come back later. It'll be here. Time gives us the dimension of movement or change. Awareness of time is consciousness, knowing who we are, where we come from, and where we are going. Good leaders try to learn about the past and gain insight into the future so that they can lead effectively. Time is life. We have an entire lifetime to explore this dimension. Some are born with an innate sense of time. Others need to work diligently with the concepts of space and movement in order to attain it. Some travel great distances to learn the meaning of life. Personally, I would rather dance. One who has mastered time finds in it some degree of satisfaction. Thomas Hobbes' Bodies in Motion, Materialism, is strongly linked to time. Since he recognized that everything is in motion, he was acutely aware of time. His philosophy fits quite well here, along with Benedictus de Spinoza and other philosophers who did not understand or admit to the existence of free will. The existing dimensions stop here. The remaining dimensions may appear to be closed off to a person and require more energy or creative effort to open them. Also the dimension of free will, choice or change is the next dimension after time. Through the process of choice, we get the concept of alternative futures, alternative times, and the chance to lie about, revise, or change our attitude toward the past. With choice comes responsibility and the authority to carry it out. Without that, it really wasn't much of a choice, was it? Whether or not the future is predetermined, leaders, even in the lowest positions in life, seem to have the amazing ability to make a decision, sending us into a different future than the one that we thought was predetermined for us. And although many of us seem to be unable to change old habits, letting tobacco companies, beer commercials, and oil conglomerates make decisions for us about the things we buy, we like to hold fast to the idea that people can change. Someday we will make a choice. That we even have a choice is a matter of philosophical debate. This dimension is the first mental or quantum dimension, so it is often exploited by New Age philosophy, touting quantum physics paradoxes known as Schrodinger's cat the now famous double slit experiment as proof that what becomes reality is in fact decided by the observer or mind. This agrees with George Berkeley's empirical idealism and his decisions concerning imagination and experiences. Few would accept his notion that nothing exists outside the mind, but for someone who cannot comprehend past this dimension, it does seem that the mind encompasses all dimensions below it. There are, I believe, dimensions beyond the mind, as we shall see in the dimensions beyond choice. I hope we are all here by choice. If there is anyone here who wish to prove that it is impossible to make a choice, they may choose to leave now. If anyone chooses to leave, they have just made a choice, thus admitting that choice is possible. Once we get into the subject of choice and free will, we immediately find ourselves confronting a series of moral and ethical questions. My philosophy leaves it up to the reader as the final judge of what constitutes a right or wrong choice. I believe we all have a sense of what is right and wrong, known as a conscience, that we can consult for matters such as these, and the conscience predates any philosophical argument. 
When the choice isn't clear, I would encourage research and consultation with someone experienced in making the kinds of decisions in question. But ultimately, I think we should make our own decisions and be prepared for the consequences, if any. The dimension of creativity or bridge building extends the dimension of choice or mind. There is this widespread myth that we are supposed to become less creative as we age, but we unknowingly practice creativity all the time. To become creative, simply create a new choice that wasn't there before, or take one away. The decision to build a boat gives us new choices that we didn't have before, a choice to cross the sea or go fishing whenever we want. Just as there are better and better boats for what we want to do, there are infinite grades of creativity. The decision to have a child or to be a good parent creates a bunch of new choices and takes away others. By giving people more choices than they take away, a leader can grant more freedom. Too much freedom or too many choices can cause paralysis, however, according to a video I saw on TED Talks. The ideal number of choices for a particular decision seems to be four or five. I think some people may prefer more. What do you think? Also known as the dimension of faith, motivation, inspired creativity, or art. The dimension of inspiration is the dimension of freedom above creativity. It is the dimension of creative vision and real sight. Others may seem blind by comparison, but such sight usually expresses itself through creativity. One surely a leader, who masters the art of inspiration, can move mountains. Their million-dollar secret is they can do this either by being able to self-motivate and pick up a shovel themselves, or by motivating others, or paying them, to do the work for them. The mountain does not just stand for a mound of dirt. It is the symbol for any endeavor or job that needs to be done. The visionary has no trouble motivating because they can get others to see the job as though it is already done. Like decision-making, many people are comfortable just sitting back and receiving their faith or inspiration, letting others inspire or motivate them. Their concept of faith is one of following a leader or having a religion. There is nothing wrong with that. We need followers. Stop calling them sheep. But why look to religious or philosophical texts, leaders, artists, and great people? Might we not also develop the thing that makes a person great or inspirational and move our own mountains? Well, now we can. Martin Luther King, Jr. was perhaps the most prominent and inspirational figure in the American Civil Rights Movement. His visionary inspiration served to argue effectively for the rights of all people. He showed us a world where everyone has equal choice to create their own destiny, opening the dimensions of philosophy to everyone to travel freely and ultimately become inspirational themselves. Also the dimension of luck. The genius, or fool as the case may be, takes a great leap of faith in trying to take the vision of inspiration and make it real. The genius pioneers new art forms, extending the state of the art and pushing the boundaries of creativity. By combining the current state of the art in new ways, they are able to have it do things, such as make bicycle parts into an airplane, as the Wright brothers have done. Martin Luther King was a motivational genius and also belongs here. Sometimes a person can arrive at genius by accident, or by doing something that is either amazingly clever or stupid enough to be viewed sarcastically as genius. Was Balloon Boy a flop or potentially a marketing genius? If the Heenies had a decent book or story to sell, they could have made millions. But instead, the balloon boy has become a meme for all that is hollow, false alarms, empty promises, and pie in the sky. St. Thomas Aquinas is known for crafting ingenious, or foolish according to some, cosmological and teleological arguments in favor of the existence of God. In a discussion question, I was inspired by St. Thomas Aquinas to write something that others thought was genius. There must be some purpose to this essay of life, and I believe it is, as it has always been, up to the reader or observer, for in them is the answer to all that can be written. Also known as the dimension of experience, the dimension of application, practice, mastery, love, wizardry, or programming as the case may be, the master perfects themselves through repeated application and practice. Only through constant practice and application of their abilities will they reach the next dimension. A wizard employs the work of hundreds of geniuses. Whether they craft a new philosophy into existence, design a wine bottle, clock mechanism, computer, or whatever else can be fabricated, the wizard applies technologies made possible by geniuses that came before. Yes, anybody can be a wizard, thanks to the dimension of application. Applying oneself adds a dimension of character above genius or luck. An experienced parent is as much a wizard when it comes to applying what they have learned towards the raising of children. Often thought of as a true wizard for his applied creativity, Leonardo da Vinci would like my philosophy for not being like others, but he would not encourage everyone to follow it, nor would he like to be mentioned here. He would say that instead of taking his or my word for it, 
we should use our own intelligence and put it to work. According to evolutionary philosophy, Leonardo da Vinci said anyone who conducts an argument by appealing to authority is not using his intelligence, he is just using his memory. Miyamoto Musashi was one of Japan's foremost philosophers. His book, The Book of Five Rings, emphasized application or practice as the way to attain excellence. He would agree that excellence is a legendary trait, and he probably achieved legendary status through the dimension of practice and application more than any other. Excellence is not the only force of application, however. The reader is encouraged to repeat whatever they do best. Even the bad actor who continues to get in the news for drinking and driving is moving through the dimension of application towards becoming a legend. Once a suitable amount of experience has been gained, be it years or hours, a person may become legendary. Whether good or bad, a legend is always talked about. This is also the dimension of fame, attainment, wealth, or whatever reward merit the applications of these principles. Maybe even the chance to turn one's life around in prison? The goal of philosophy is not to make judgments, but to permit everyone to navigate through the philosophical dimensions and systematically reach their goals, whatever they may be. Socrates was a hard-working stonemason with a keen intellect and a reputation for debate. Although not an author, he was certainly a legend because of his Socratic method and famous dialogues which came from a wellspring of experience. Bob Marley is a legend for consistently producing brilliant, evocative music. The maker of legends, an author, creates the outline, sets up the scene, and brings the characters to life. Without an author or storyteller to bring the legends to us, how would we ever know of them? Some people are natural authors, and some legends write their own autobiographies to become authors. However they get there, authors agree that authorship is a dimension above legend. Much of what we know about the legendary Socrates came from his student, Plato. Socrates was not himself an author, so without Plato we would probably know little or nothing about him. Plato would agree that writing things down, or being an author, is important. Today's authors use various mediums and come from all walks of life, providing us with an amazing and fantastic resource of interdimensional expression. Also, the dimension of philosophy, the publisher, library, website, or intermediary between author and audience, sits in a plane or dimension beyond authorship. There are legendary authors, but only the publisher or teacher gets the material into the hands of the audience or student, and some go on to publish or promote their own works and serve as a gateway for other authors and artists. These are the true greats. Without a publisher, teacher, or a university behind them and people talking about them, these concepts would never see the light of day. Without the audience, all of this, and indeed this presentation, would not be possible. Being a good audience for others, and being able to understand and work with audiences, is the highest dimension. To quote my earlier paper on Western philosophers, in her work Beyond God the Father, Mary Daly gives thousands of years of patriarchal, male-dominated religious philosophy the exhaustively comprehensive send-off it so richly deserves. By exploring the plausible characterization of God as an instrument of oppression and dehumanization, Mary Daly firmly establishes herself as an elevator of social consciousness in women's liberation movements, or liberation movements in general. I say liberation movements because it is an ongoing process. Also, not all men appreciate being thrust into dominating roles, and perhaps many of them do not wish to be stereotyped as being innately chauvinistic or aggressive in behavior. Liberation movements can be liberating for men as well as women. Mary Daly knew her audience better than other philosophers before her. Most importantly, she knew that many of them were women. She moved her audience into participating in philosophy, paving the way for real philosophical progress. When the audience is growing, we are reaching out to the highest philosophical dimensions, allowing everyone to more easily navigate these dimensions towards greatness, finding an active, involved, and participating audience for our ideas. I have attempted to map this complex journey and provide some references to mark the major landmarks of philosophical progress. Recognizing and building upon the works of others is the anchor that keeps us from being washed up on the shores of public criticism. So read, study, and talk about things to people. Show them where knowledge can be found, even if it might be wrong. Talk to them about this presentation if you like, and thanks for watching.